evaluation of new treatment approaches for inflammatory skin diseases and conducts clinical trials in this area. As a physician scientist with training in basic immunology, Dr. Damsky's laboratory leverages the latest immunologic approaches to understand mechanisms of inflammatory skin disease and how they are affected by novel therapies. As a dermatopathologist, he is interested in developing tools to help probe immunologic changes in skin biopsies to aid in diagnosis and personalized treatment selection. He has been awarded the Young Investigator Awards from the American Academy of Dermatology and the American Society for, Cl for Clinical Investigation for his work. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Gamsky. Thanks so much, Kelly, for the, the great introduction and welcome everyone um, to this session. We, uh, I never anticipated presenting uh, in Global Dermatology Talks, but we had a cancellation. And so um, I figured I would uh, just jump in and, and share some of our work. Um, so let's get going. Um, here are my disclosures. All right, so here's an outline of today's talk. Um, we're gonna talk about sarcoidosis and granuloma annulare. Um, and um, we'll go through each disease by itself. So just by way of introduction, um, um, term, a little bit of terminology. So when we say granuloma, uh, in general, we're re referring to a group of tightly associated macrophages. And pictured on the left um, is just about as perfect an example of a granuloma that we can uh, see in tissue. In contrast, um, granulomatous inflammation um, is um, a histologic finding where macrophages are a predominant cell type in the infiltrate, but they don't necessarily form these well-formed granulomas. Um, and multinucleate giant cells are uh, groups of um, macrophages that have actually fused their cytoplasm, and that's a feature of both disorders um, or both clinical uh, histologic patterns, rather. Um, and so where do we see granulomas inflammation? Well, probably um, the most common or one of the more common uh, settings is in the setting of an infection. And this is probably why these immunologic programs exist. So on the uh, upper left-hand corner here, we see an example of leprosy. We can also see granulomas in the setting of other infections like mycobacterial infections, fungal infections, and other settings. As a dermatopathologist, we commonly see um, granulomatous inflammation occur in the setting of foreign body reactions. So keratin is a common one, like a ruptured cyst, for example. This is kind of the cleanup crew that comes in to um, get rid of this foreign material. And there's a variety of other settings that that can be seen as well. But what I'm particularly interested in is when we see granulomas or granulomas inflammation in the setting of inflammatory diseases. And the diseases that I'm going to talk about today are sarcoidosis and granuloma annulare. But in dermatology, this is by no means um, the only setting in which we see these, these, these disorders. These are also common in medicine. And so sarcoidosis, uh, as we know, is a disease that can affect multiple organ systems outside the skin. And so, of course, we can see granulomatous inflammation or granulomas in this context um, outside the skin. Crohn's disease is another uh, setting which folks may be uh, familiar with, but certainly these aren't the only settings in which we can see granulomatous inflammation in an autoimmune or inflammatory setting um, outside the skin. And so before we kind of uh, get to the main part of the talk, um, let's consider sarcoidosis and granuloma annulare. What are the clinical and histologic features? First, sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is an idiopathic inflammatory disorder. It's actually quite common. Uh, so in the United States, it's most common in Black or African-American individuals, and you can see the incidence rates listed here on the slide. Outside of the United States, that's not necessarily the case. So for example, in Scandinavian countries where it's also quite common, um, it's more common in Caucasian individuals. Um, and so you can see some of the uh, incidence statistics there. Although these numbers seem quite high, um, you'll see these numbers out there in the literature in terms of the prevalence of the disease. And so some studies have published that as many as one in 25 Black or African-American women will develop um, sarcoidosis at some point during their lives. And this, this seems a little bit high to me, but again, this is what's out there. And um, these patients may not all necessarily require treatment. But importantly, sarcoidosis can be serious. 
So um, although the numbers aren't great, a thousand or more deaths um, have been estimated to be due to sarcoidosis um, in the US uh, alone uh, on an annual basis. Sarcoidosis can affect nearly any organ system. The lungs and the lymph nodes around the lungs are the most common, but the heart, eyes, and GI tract, as well as other organs can also be involved. And skin involvement is um, not uncommon. So one in three patients can have sarcoidosis in their skin, and occasionally this is the only site of the disease. What do we look for in terms of clinical morphology? Well, sarcoidosis presents as pink red to red brown um, papules, plaques, or nodules. They're often annular. Classically, there's no or minimal epidermal change, but this isn't always the case. Unfortunately, ulceration and scarring are possible, and involvement of the face is common, and so this makes it to be um, a very difficult disease to, to actually be affected by. Scars and tattoos, interestingly, can also be um, commonly involved for reasons we don't fully understand, and sarcoidosis is often called the great mimicker, and so there's other presentations as well. Switching gears to granuloma annulare, um, it's also an idiopathic inflammatory disorder. Thanks to some um, new uh, studies, we have a better understanding of what the, the prevalence of granuloma annulare is, at least in the United States, where as up to um, one in uh, 1,400, 1,400 individuals may suffer from this disease. In contrast to sarcoidosis, although it's not serious, um, um, there can be um, certain um, negative uh, impacts on the quality of life, which I'll talk a little bit more about in patients affected by this disease. Um, most cases are limited in distribution, so about 75% of cases are what so-called localized granuloma annulare, and it may self-resolve over approximately two years, and patients are often counseled that this may be the case, but that may not necessarily happen, and it may also recur. Um, other cases are widespread and otherwise severe and do not self-resolve. And I'd like to make the point that we don't really have good ways to predict who will self-resolve um, versus who will persist or worsen over time. There's an association, thanks again to some newer epidemiologic work, that um, granuloma annulare is associated with autoimmune diseases, including lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And um, I'll show you a little bit of our own data uh, to illustrate this, but granuloma annulare can really have a significantly negative impact on the quality of life for individuals affected by it. So comparing to sarcoidosis, um, the typical clinical morphology of granuloma annulare is actually quite similar in a lot of respects. The lesions are pink to dull pink in color. Um, classical lesions include papules and plaques. They're often annular, similar to sarcoidosis. Again, classically no epidermal change, and this tends to be a little bit more of a uh, conserved feature in uh, granuloma annulare as opposed to sarcoidosis, where sometimes you can have some epidermal change. It can involve subcutaneous tissue, and sometimes this is referred to as deep GA. Patches or um, flat macular lesions may occur in flexural areas, and this, at least in my practice, I find is particularly common on the medial thighs or other flexural areas, particularly in women. Uh, and that there may be some overlap with what so-called interstitial granulomatous dermatitis. And sometimes this is referred to as patch GA, but sometimes these patients will have uh, more classic GA lesions in other areas. Um, the lesions can be photodistributed or accentuated, uh, so-called annular elastolytic giant cell granuloma is a common example of that where patients may have these annular plaques in their forehead. Um, and really the, the presentation is quite varied. So in the uh, clinical image on the upper right, you can see these very small annular papules. This is highly zoomed in. In the bottom right, you can see these very large coalescing annular plaques. So you can have very small uh, annular lesions. You can have quite large annular lesions. So it's quite um, variable. So as a dermatopathologist, I really like to, of course, look at things under the microscope, and this influences the way that I think about disease pathogenesis. So what do we see when we look under the microscope at lesions of sarcoidosis and granuloma annulare? Well, for sarcoidosis, we see these really um, well-organized uh, spheres or circles in two dimensions of granulomatous inflammation. Uh, and so here we have epithelioid or um, uh, macrophages that look like epithelial cells, but they have large nuclei and abundant cytoplasm, um, uh, forming, again, these spheres in tissue um, where they really pack uh, closely to each other. Although in dermatology, we often learn that sarcoidosis has so-called naked granulomas, meaning that they don't have a lot of T-cell infiltrate. Um, 
I would uh, like to just point out that there are T cells there, and we really think about um, T cells as being important in disease pathogenesis. And so I'll come back to this as the as the talk goes on. In contrast, when we look at granuloma annulare under the microscope, despite the potentially similar uh, or overlapping clinical features of these diseases, we see a very different pattern. And so there are two different patterns of G under the microscope. One is called palisaded, the other is called interstitial. And so if you look at the top of your screen, palisaded is I think probably what most people think about when they think about GA under the microscope. We have areas of macrophages that are palisading or surrounding areas of degenerated or altered extracellular matrix material. There are perivascular lymphocytes or um, uh, T cells predominantly, which are pictured here as a cartoon, as well as um, a, a, an actual h &E that we see under the microscope. A second pattern of granuloma annularia is so-called interstitial pattern. And here, there's less, less well-formed palisades or, again, surround, uh, macrophages surrounding um, altered collagen. And um, they're more, it's more just macrophages or histiocytes for um, the pathology lingo, um, sort of in between collagen bundles. And the in relative importance and meaning of these different patterns is not fully understood in granuloma annularia. A lot of cases, if you look at um, different areas of the lesion under the microscope, you can see features of either. And so um, that, that really remains to be fully resolved. But um, this, these are the two main patterns that we see under the microscope. So in my laboratory, we're really interested in um, clinical pathologic and sort of immunologic correlation. And so when we're looking at sarcoidosis and GA from a bird's eye view, there's some similarities and there's some differences. One similarity is that the clinical lesions are both annular. Um, uh, again, sort of circular areas with raised borders. Um, in sarcoidosis, of course, we have internal organ involvement, whereas in granuloma and annularia, in general, we do not. Um, in sarcoidosis, we have well-formed granulomas, again, tightly packed macrophages in a spear, whereas in granuloma and annularia, we don't. In sarcoidosis, we tend not to have palisading or altered extracellular matrix material, whereas in granuloma and annularia, we don't. And so really the question when I started looking into this is why? Um, and we're really interested in immunology in our lab. And so we wanted to take these clinical and pathologic or histologic observations and kind of dissect the immunology and understand why you're actually seeing these different patterns. And of course, the critical molecular mediators. I want to take a, a, a brief segue and talk about treatment of sarcoidosis and granuloma annulare. Um, and that will sort of contextualize a lot of the rest of the talk. So sarcoidosis, for sarcoidosis, the only FDA-approved therapy is prednisone, which is a steroid that can have a number of different side effects, and that's actually only approved for pulmonary sarcoidosis. So if you have sarcoidosis outside the lung, including in your skin, there's actually no FDA-approved therapy, although it's often used off-label for these indications. When we look at treatment of the skin, we can see um, this, this very nice figure on the left here showing what commonly used therapies are. Um, these are all off-label, and depending on the severity of cutaneous involvement, um, something as um, you know, simple as topical intralesional therapies may be used for patients with more extensive involvement or patients where the intent to treat is also related to internal organ involvement, uh, stronger medications may be used. For granuloma annulare, there are no FDA-approved therapies, this depend, regardless of the severity. Um, medications that we use to treat granuloma annularia, again, are all off-label. The vast majority are borrowed from sarcoidosis or other inflammatory disorders. And so I cut and pasted the, um, you know, sort of this treatment algorithm uh, that's dependent on severity onto the right side of this slide. Um, but I think for those of us that have ever treated granuloma annularia or sarcoidosis for that matter, I think it would be fair to say that treatment of these disorders can be fairly um, difficult um, despite these agents. Um, other therapies are also used for granuloma annularia, which you see listed there on the right. And so this is a little bit of a aside or soapbox, um, but I, I, I do feel sort of compelled to show this based on the, the patients that I've seen um, over the past several years. And so 
not not to minimize the potential severity of psoriasis. Um, of course, these patients can be erythrodermic, they can be hospitalized, they can have other issues, including arthritis or cardiovascular disease. Um, but we have so many treatments to offer these patients. In contrast, um, granuloma annulari, um, we have really nothing to offer these patients. And sort of the culture has been that we may um, not necessarily offer these patients aggressive therapy, even if we feel that they may deserve it and you can, or may, you know, sort of necessitate it in order to clear their disease. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see a, a, a quote from one of my patients. Um, and I, I, I like these pictures because, um, the presentation in terms of distribution is actually pretty similar and the primary, the primary lesion morphology is really what varies. And, you know, the patient on the right really would have no problem starting any number of systemic therapies. Um, but the vast majority of GA patients, again, with a different morphology, um, tend to go undertreated. And we actually just completed a study that sort of, um, I think, you know, sort of um, exemplifies this quite nicely. So this is a study that was based on a survey of patients in a Facebook group that have granuloma annularis. So there may be some, some bias about which patients were actually surveying here, but we got 900 or so responses. And on the left, I'm showing you the responses to the Skindex 16 score. So for those unfamiliar, Skindex 16 is a quality of life survey. Um, for um, dermatologic disorders that has three different uh, subscale symptoms, emotional and functional impact of disease. And really what I wanna highlight is the emotional impact of disease for these patients. Um, the vast majority of patients have a very severe effect on um, their emotional functioning uh, because of their granuloma annulari. So I, I think that's sort of been under-recognized and this is work that we're um, interested in publishing. And we also survey these patients in terms of what they've been treated with. And so this is a pretty busy slide, but along the bottom, you'll see commonly used uh, uh, interventions or therapies for granuloma annulari. And the way that we sort of ask this is, this is all patient reported, is whether they've had these therapies or they use these therapies and whether or not they uh, had long lasting improvement, temporary improvement, unsatisfactory improvement or worsening or haven't used or can't remember, which is in gray. And so there's a lot of gray on this slide. And so although we have these tools that we think could potentially be effective in patients um, with granuloma annulari, most patients haven't been exposed to these. In terms of topical steroids, which is probably you know, the most common first line intervention for patients with granuloma annulari, you can see only 1.2% of patients actually experience long lasting improvement. And in fact, we had, um, sort of open uh, response questions uh, as part of the survey. And, and a lot of patients commented on how um, topical corticosteroids were not only not effective, but less helpful because they had local side effects. And I won't spend a whole lot of time dwelling on this, but um, again, I, I think you can see by the relative lack of greens and yellows on this slide that um, we need better tools to treat our patients with granuloma annulari. And so the question is, is there a pathogenesis-directed therapy um, for these disorders? And sort of related questions are what are the key drivers of disease and how can we potentially target them? Okay, so switching gears specifically to sarcoidosis. Um, I started working in sarcoidosis when I was a dermatology resident. Um, this, is, this figure is from a review that was published at that time um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it summarized the, the various um, molecular mediators or the proposed molecular mediators of this disease at the time. And um, the specifics of this figure aren't really that important, um, but really this paradigm, if you look to the left-hand side of the slide, is that um, somehow a T-cell response is activated uh, molecules called cytokines likely are important in that. One way or another, monocytes and macrophages are recruited to the area. Um, we think additional cytokines, or the field thought at the time, additional cytokines were important and then actually form in the granulomas. And then there's probably some sort of positive feedback loop in which um, um, signals from the granuloma perpetuate this T cell response. And when we actually broke down this figure and looked at um, the different cytokines that folks have identified over the years, 
for sarcoidosis pathogenesis, we were very struck by the fact that the vast majority of them were JAK-STAT dependent cytokines. Um, and so what is JAK-STAT signaling? Well, JAK-STAT signaling is um, a very commonly utilized method of um, cytokine signaling. And so JAK-STAT dependent cytokines um, are secreted into the extracellular space. They bind to the receptor on their target cells and through a series of phosphorylation events actually recruit JAK and ultimately STAT proteins to the cell surface. Um, and STAT proteins are the effector of this pathway. So cytokine uh, signal, JAK activation, STAT activation, STATs are transcription factors. They go into the nucleus and they affect the response. Well, there's this really neat class of uh, medications called JAK inhibitors. And um, JAK inhibitors inhibit that signaling cascade. There's, a, as you can see on the left-hand uh, um, part of the slide, there's a large number of cytokines that actually signal via the JAK-STAT pathway. I've outlined in red those that were uh, implicated in sarcoidosis pathogenesis, but you can see inhibition or modulation of the JAK-STAT pathway is a potential to infect a, affect a broad number of cytokines. Um, and... Um, this, it's, it's been kind of interesting as this field has changed over time to see how this slide has changed. Um, there's actually a large number of JAK, stat, or JAK inhibitors that have been used in medicine as well as now in dermatology. Um, and you can see some of those indications uh, listed to the right. We now have dermatologic specific indications and a large number of medications. And this is an area that's really just exploding. Um, and so this slide is, is getting busier than it used to be. Uh, but nonetheless, this sort of overviews JAK inhibitors. And so the question when I started this work a while ago is would a JAK inhibitor actually work to treat sarcoidosis? We know that it can uh, inhibit a lot of cytokines that have been proposed to be in, involved in disease pathogenesis. So this was a patient that I saw when I was a dermatology, re dermatology resident. She had a, a um, eight-year history of cutaneous sarcoidosis. She also had sarcoidosis in her lungs. She had quite extensive BSA involvement, and she had failed a number of therapies, including those um, commonly used to treat sarcoidosis, including methotrexate and TNF-alpha inhibitors. When I was um, working with Brett King as a resident, this patient was treated with uh, oral toposinib, which is a JAK-1, 2, 3 inhibitor, sort of a pan-JAK inhibitor, and really she had a very remarkable response to therapy. Um, such that when looking at her skin uh, from a histologic uh, point of view before therapy on the left or after therapy on the right, we can see that um, in A, there are, is granulomatous inflammation or frank granulomas under the microscope highlighted by a CD68 stain um, on the left, on the right, under B, um, really the granulomas have gone away. And so in our research, uh, at least at that time, we had been commonly using this technique where we do immunohistochemistry for activated stat proteins or phosphorylated stat proteins. And again, whereas we can see on the left that there's um, before treatment evidence of JAK stat pathway activation um, 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 sort of demarcated by these phosphorylated stat proteins uh, on the left um, after therapy, these, these, um, this signal tends to go away. And so we started, we were really struck by this observation and we wondered about other patients with cutaneous sarcoidosis. And so we actually put together um, a series of biopsies of patients with sarcoidosis um, versus those with just control skin or a, a non-inflammatory granulomatous disorder called um, xanthelasma. And really we were struck by the pattern that we observed, both for phosphostat one and phosphostat three. We observed that um, all cases of sarcoidosis had evidence of activation of this pathway um, as signified by both STAT1 and STAT3. Importantly, um, detection of phosphorylation of these proteins does not tell us which cytokine is activating the cell, but it does tell us that something is activating the cell. And so although it's relatively nonspecific, we found that the, the vast majority of sarcoidosis cases that we looked at had activation of this pathway. And so we wondered what would happen when other patients were treated with this and found, found really um, sort of remarkable efficacy in a few patients that um, also were treated off-label. And this is a, an example of that, a patient on hydroxychloroquine uh, achieving minimal control. And you can see how well she did when she was switched to a JAK inhibitor. And so at this point, we really thought we were onto something. And um, we started wondering, you know, of course, you know, sarcoidosis in the skin is a big problem. 
um, but potentially a bigger problem is sarcoidosis in internal organs. And so we wondered whether or not the responses that we might see in the skin um, might also happen in internal organs. And the way that we first approached that was by, again, doing this immunohistochemical test where we look at activation of um, the JAK-STAT signaling pathway in tissue. And we chose to look at pulmonary sarcoidosis because it's very common. Um, and really quite remarkably, we found a very similar pattern of activation. Again, this doesn't tell us which cytokine is turning on the pathway, but it tells us the pathway was activated. And we see um, at the top of the slide in the middle, um, STAT1 phosphorylation or activation sort of in the center of the granulomas and STAT3 activation sort of outside the granulomas in the areas of lymphoid um, infiltrate. And so we thought that potentially it could work for internal organ sarcoidosis. And this is the first patient, at least at Yale, that was intentionally treated um, for her sarcoidosis with a JAK inhibitor. And it turns out that uh, sarcoidosis is kind of an interesting disease metabolically in that it can be visualized by PET scan, which is usually used for um, you know, evaluations of, of patients with malignancy. Um, but sarcoidal granulomas actually high, have a high rate of glucose metabolism. And so we can actually see the granulomas on PET scan. And so we were fortunate enough to be able to um, evaluate this patient um, who you can see on the left here, the left scan was on prednisone, mycophenolate, IVIG, and rituximab for her sarcoidosis at the time when we first met her. And she actually went for a PET scan. And you can see that not only did she have disease activity in her lung, but she also had disease activity in her skin, which you can see in her leg, sort of highlighted by um, that large um, black area, which was all granuloma, which was evident clinically. We greatly simplified her regimen, and she um, was treated with a relatively higher dose of tofacitinib. The IVIG was stopped, the rituximab was stopped, and really she had a quite beautiful response, as you can see on the right. And here's just a different view, but we can see that the, the um, sarcoidal inflammation in her lung was controlled by um, this therapy. And so to us, that suggested that there was some possibility that it could work for internal organ disease as well. We were able to collect um, uh, plasma from this patient or blood from the patient, as well as lesional biopsy tissue, and look at some, uh, some um, sarcoidosis biomarkers and saw that there was reduction in the activity of these markers with therapy, which also gave us um, um, you know, some confidence that those working. What was really fun was to see others um, really around the world um, using this approach to treat patients with sarcoidosis. So these are all case reports and small case series, which of course are biased towards patients that have better results. Um, but we're seeing a lot of we're seeing a lot of complete re responses reported in the skin, um, a lot of complete responses or near complete responses uh, uh, reported in the lung or in other areas. These are patients that have very long-standing disease, so we would think that spontaneous remission probably would be relatively unlikely, um, covering all skin types, and um, which I'll, I'll come back to at the end, there were some patients that actually responded to topical JAK inhibition. And so we decided to do this open-label clinical trial where we looked at patients with uh, 10 patients with uh, sarcoidosis with cutaneous involvement. It was a six-month study. Um, uh, patients um, had to have skin involvement. We followed their skin involvement using the CSAMI score, which is a validated um, sarcoidosis severity score of the skin. We did um, biopsies and blood collection before and after therapy to follow biomarkers and other changes. Um, but we also used um, PET scans, like I showed you before, sarcoidosis can be followed by PET scans. Um, to follow internal organ involvement in patients before and after six months of therapy. We went with a five milligram twice daily dose, which is the lower of two FDA approved doses. And um, here's a summary of how patients did in terms of their skin. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that um, patients at baseline tended to be on therapies commonly used for sarcoidosis. Uh, including plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, and prednisone. Um, despite these therapies, again, not every patient was on therapy, but the majority were. You can see in the graph in the middle that via the CSAMI index or activity index, that all of these patients, despite these therapies, had active skin disease. And this is illustrated on the left 
with a clinical photograph at the bottom, as well as a PET scan, um, showing that, again, despite therapy, patients had active disease. Patients were treated with topocitinib for a period of six months. They were sort of able to taper their baseline immunosuppressive therapies at um, you know, sort of the investigator discretion and their discretion based on how they were doing and feeling. And you can see on the right-hand side of the slide that not only were patients um, able to have improvement in their skin, they were also able to discontinue these therapies like methotrexate and prednisone, prednisone in particular, a medication that can have, have um, pretty significant adverse effects. Here's some examples of how folks um, did. Um, this patient on the left had subcutaneous nodules, which turned into post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. This patient had sarcoidal dactylitis. You can see on the top left that this was actually so severe that this patient had one of his toes um, electively amputated because it was bothering him so much. Um, and on the bottom, you can see that these violaceous red uh, infiltrative plaques turn really into these light um, pink-brown um, patches. And there's a lot of improvement in the nail dystrophy um, in this patient who was very happy with the response. Um, here's a patient with an annular plaque on the left cheek, a lot of uh, nasal involvement, um, also did very well. There's some scarring, of course, in this patient, a very long-standing disease. Another patient was sort of a lupus perneal presentation who had a, a, a nice response. And then what about internal organ disease in these patients? Well, actually, the internal organ responses mirrored those that they're observed in the skin. And so I should just say very briefly, um, we, we chose to follow these patients using PET scans. Um, PET scans are not um, by any means the agreed upon way to follow, you know, internal organ sarcoidosis. We did not follow pulmonary function tests, um, but we could kind of only follow so much. And we chose this because we thought that the PET scans would reflect active granulomatous inflammation. And so this patient on the left was on methotrexate and prednisone. You can see still how much disease activity that she had at baseline. Um, she was switched to, um, or eventually ended up on topocitinib uh, at a lower dose of prednisone. This patient's now off prednisone and she had really nice control of her disease. Um, another example of a patient that had a really nice response to their internal organ disease um, on therapy. And even one patient that had myocardial involvement that also had a very nice response um, to tofacitinib and monotherapy um, um, during this trial. And so something that we have observed is that there really appears to be a dose-dependent response um, in, in patients with sarcoidosis that are treated with JAK inhibitors. And this is a really nice example of this. This is uh, by no means the only example we have of this now, but um, this is one of the patients sort of during and after the trial that if you um, look at the three panels here, during the trial at six months had sort of um, partial control of his cutaneous disease. After the trial, the patient elected to increase the dose of the tofacitinib um, to try to achieve greater control of the skin. And you can see that there's now complete, complete resolution. So maybe this is partially higher dose, maybe this is partially um, uh, longer duration of treatment, but nonetheless, a really nice response. Even more dramatically, if we, we look at the PET scan for this patient, um, on the, the left-hand side of the screen, we see that there's really dramatic uptake. And the, this patient uh, is one that you've worried had lymphoma, but the, the lymph nodes were biopsied and um, it, was, it was all sarcoidosis. And you can see while there's some improvement in the middle um, panel, which is a little bit harder to see when actually looking at the scans, but if you look at this total lesional glycolysis, the part in yellow, um, there's really uh, nearly only a third of the signal left um, after six months of therapy to lower dose. Quite remarkably, again, this patient had um, very dramatic improvement with just a small increase in the dose and a longer duration of therapy about a year out. We follow blood biomarkers in these patients, and um, this is relative to healthy control patients um, without sarcoidosis. And you can, again, see that Six months at a lower dose had some disease control. 12 months at a slightly higher dose, dose had really uh, complete disease control. And so the question is, why does JAK inhibition work in sarcoidosis? Um, we recently published this paper um, that has a lot of immunology in it. I chose not to um, go through it in great detail for today's talk, but I'd be certainly happy to talk about it. But we did bulk RNA sequencing from skin. We did single cell RNA 
RNA sequencing from skin. Um, we use a variety of informatic approaches. We also follow blood in these patients. And kind of putting that all together in the context of how patients did on therapy, we came up with this model. And a lot of our focus is on JAK-STAT dependent cytokines because we know that JAK inhibitors are targeting JAK-STAT dependent cytokines. And really we think that um, JAK inhibitors and sarcoidosis are predominantly inhibiting interferon gamma. So inter interferon gamma is a cytokine that leads to classical macrophage activation. And there's a lot of reasons um, beyond sort of our data to think that this may be a key cytokine. Other cytokines, including GMCSF, IL-6, IL-15, IL-12, are also JAK-STAT dependent cytokines and are likely also important as secondary cytokines and are to some degree inhibited by um, JAK inhibitors. And so to sort of answer that question, why do we think um, JAK inhibitors are working in sarcoidosis? Well, they have an ability to simultaneously inhibit a number of these different cytokines as sort of illustrated on the right-hand side of the screen. And so in summary, um, for the sarcoidosis part, um, sarcoidosis can be difficult to treat. Prednisone is the only FDA-approved therapy, and it's only approved for pulmonary sarcoidosis. Uh, based on the work of us and others, JAK inhibition appears to be a promising treatment approach uh, for this disease. Based on our work, we think that interferon gamma is the main target um, that um, is sort of inhibited by JAK inhibitors. And uh, explaining why these patients appear to do so well in therapy, although other cytokines, uh, jak stat dependent or otherwise, probably also are important as well. Um, and there, there of course, have been uh, safety questions around JAK inhibitors, which I didn't really incorporate into the talk, but I'd be happy to discuss during the Q&A. Um, and so ongoing evaluation of risk-benefit profiles, of course, going to be important. Um, in the last 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to talk about our work in granuloma annulari. Um, so we, uh, uh, um, we're really intrigued, I guess, is the way I see it, say it, um, at the response of observed in sarcoidosis with um, JAK inhibitors. And so we kind of turned back to this um, tool that we really like using uh, immunohistochemistry to evaluate for activated stat uh, proteins in tissue. And although, you know, sort of talking about the differences in JAK stat activation between sarcoidosis and GA could be a talk unto itself, I'll, I'll just summarize and say briefly that although, um, the, pat although the pattern of JAK stat activation histologically that we observed in sarcoidosis was different from that observed in granuloma annulari and also appeared to be activated in granuloma annulari. And this is quantified here. Uh, on the left, you can see in purple and red, uh, sarcoidosis, skin and lung, versus granuloma annulari in blue. Um, particularly for STAT1, there's not much uh, um, activation, but it is actually still significantly different from skin. So there's sort of this low um, JAK STAT activation. And we think that STAT1 activation is primarily reflecting interferon gamma. And so there's sort of this low level interferon gamma activation in, in, um, in granulum annulari. STAT3 on the right-hand side had more comparable activation in sarcoidosis, although uh, albeit a bit, a bit lower in sort of terms of magnitude. Nonetheless, um, based on this evidence um, and the lack of really reliably effective therapies in granuloma annulari, we wondered whether or not it could be effective um, for treatment of patients with these disorders. And this is sort of the index patient that had granuloma annulari that was treated. You can see that she failed a number of um, different therapies, things that are commonly used off-label for granuloma annulari, and really was um, sort of desperate for control of her disease. Well, she was treated with tofacitinib as well. This is, again, another case that I saw um, with Brett King when I was a resident, and she had um, really dramatic improvement in her skin such that all detectable evidence clinically of granuloma annulari um, was gone after several months of tofacitinib. Evaluation histopathologically um, showed that along the top where there is palisaded granulomous inflammation as um, evidenced by the CD68 stain and evidence of JAK stat pathway activation as evidenced by phosphostat 1 and stat 3 on therapy really that um, goes away and so it corresponds to the clinical response. And so based on sort of our molecular work, as well as um, our, that cl sort of clinical experience, we're able to put together a very small, only five patients clinical trial 
um, of oral tofacitinib in patients with severe GA. So this was a five patient, um, again, open label prospective study, tofacitinib five milligrams twice daily. The primary outcome was a change in the BSA involvement after six months of therapy. Um, you can see in the table here that these patients had very long standing disease, so six to 15 years. So again, we're suspecting that spontaneous resolution is gonna be very unlikely in these patients. Uh, BSA involvement is anywhere from seven to 30%. Patients had failed a number of commonly used therapies as you can see summarized there on the right. Here's a quick sort of uh, anecdotal look at how these patients did on therapy. This patient had small papular lesions over most of her body, all of which went away. This patient had larger plaques, some of which were photo accentuated. This patient had a lot of photo accentuated lesions. Um, so again, the sort of overlap with um, actinic granuloma. And she also did very well in therapy. Um, looking at all five together, sort of more quantitatively, uh, three patients had complete clearance of their skin on therapy. Two patients had um, partial response, but um, really were much better off, at least in terms of their skin involvement on therapy as opposed to where they're at the, at the beginning. Again, it was really fun to see uh, other folks um, noticing something similar. So here's an example of a patient with generalized GA2 with baricitinib having a very nice response. Here's a patient with a, a GA also treated with a JAK inhibitor, upadacitinib uh, as a JAK1 specific inhibitor, um, also having a very nice response. And so again, this question is why is JAK inhibition effective? Um, well, at least as part of our trial, um, we collected biopsies from patients, these five patients treated with um, tofacitinib for their GA before and then after six months of therapy. And I mentioned we had three complete responders and two partial responders. And um, we looked at RNA expression levels in their skin before and after therapy. So if you look to the right of the slide, um, red means that um, uh, gene expression is um, upregulated. Gene, uh, green means that gene expression is downregulated. And these are looking at um, key um, sort of transcriptional targets of different cytokines, like interferon gamma, oncostatin M, OSM. You can see them listed down here on the right. And really, the point that I want to make with this slide is that um, patients, if you look at before therapy, so sort of the left half of this heat map versus during therapy, patients with partial responses, PR, um, had. Um, a relatively um, incomplete ability to turn off JAK stat signaling or activation of these cytokines, whereas um, patients with CR, complete response, had really a more full ability to turn off uh, activation of these um, cytokines or at least their transcriptional signatures. And so to us, that suggests that um, at a purely conceptional level, perhaps higher doses would be more effective in partial response. I'm not necessarily advocating for you know higher uh, higher doses in these patients. Or um, I'll, I'll summarize this on the next slide: more targeted JAK inhibition in in, in name uh, JAK one inhibition might be more effective um, in these patients. And so again, just in the sake of time, I'm not showing all the molecular work that went into this. Um, but in the bottom right, we did um, single cell RNA sequencing, and we came up with sort of this model based on which cytokines we thought each cell was producing and seeing and responding to, um, to come up with this um, sort of diagram, at least in our minds, of how granulum annularity is working. Um, but if you look in the upper right-hand corner, really, I think the interesting part is that um, all of these um, cytokines signal, at least in part through, through JAK1, suggesting that JAK1 may be the key um, JAK protein in, these disorder, in this disorder. A really interesting question, something we've been looking at more lately, is the role of type 2 immunity in GA. And so um, a group from New York, um, including Emma Gutman, had looked uh, transcri transcriptionally at some cases of granuloma annulare. And whereas in our patients really, um, the we, again, we only had five patients, so the um, sort of breadth or scope of the patients that we looked at was not huge. Um, but nonetheless, we really saw TH1 or type 1 activation. So uh, interferon gamma, um, IL-15, these other cytokines. Um, but this other group found um, that not only was TH1 activated, but there appeared to be concomitant activation of TH2. 
And this is really interesting to us, an area that we're really focusing on now um, in sort of the clinical, pathologic, molecular heterogeneity. So um, the question to us is, are, are some, some patients more reliant on Th1? Are other patients more reliant on Th2? Um, or is it truly just a mix of Th1 and Th2 um, for indi any individual patient? And so again, that's something that we're really interested in looking at. Um, but it, the, the implication of type 2 or Th2 immunity in granuloma annulari is really interesting because it raises the hypothesis that dupilumab could potentially be effective uh, in treating some of these patients. And you can see a case report here. This is the only one in the literature of a patient that benefited from dupilumab therapy for granulum annulari. So I want to um, finish up uh, so we have time for Q&A. And so I'm going to just uh, spend two minutes going through the rest. Um, a question that we often get, and I'm happy to talk about it more during the Q&A period, is topical JAK inhibition uh, for both of, these, both of these disorders. I'll say that um, there are proof of concept studies out there, um, including from Misha Rosenbach's group um, at Penn, suggesting that topical JAK inhibition could be effective in both granulum, granuloma annulari and sarcoidosis. Um, but really, these are individual case reports, and we need um, uh, larger studies. So kind of coming back to this um, question of what's different between granuloma annulari and sarcoidosis, I think we're, as someone that's interested in immunology, we're really just kind of starting to um, uh, skim the surface of what's different between these two disorders. Um, but in particular, in terms of therapeutics, we think that GA really probably is a JAK1 specific disorder and um, or um, that JAK1 inhibition would be an effective way of, um, of treating this disorder. Whereas in sarcoidosis, we're not really quite sure yet. Um, GMCSF in particular signals by a JAK2 and is probably not acting as a hematopoietic growth factor here, but as a, um, a, a T cell and macrophage activator. Um, we're not sure how important inhibition of JAK2 is in that setting. Um, in sarcoidosis, other folks have looked at TH17. Um, we haven't really seen much of it in our hands, but it's something we're interested in. Uh, and again, GA, this uh, question of type 2 or TH2 immunity and potential heterogeneity. Of course, sarcoidosis is a population that or a condition that can infect the skin as well as other internal organs, whereas GA is something that's skin specific. And so what the sort of um, ontogeny or identity of T cells that are driving these disorders is of great interest to us and whether or not it um, sort of explains that difference. And so um, I'm very thankful that we've been able to um, achieve support for uh, expanded and ongoing clinical evaluation of JAK inhibition as two disorders. And um, although, I won't go through all the details. We have a number of studies looking at oral as well as topical JAK inhibition in both disorders, and um, really are excited to see what these things show. Um, we're working on um, better understanding the basic immunology of these disorders. Again, the, the scope of our uh, investigation has been relatively uh, small to this point uh, in terms of the number of uh, cases that we've looked at. Um, but we're really excited by spatial transcriptomics. I'm just showing you a couple of examples on the right here. Um, I think it's a really powerful approach and granulomatous disorders are sort of, um, you know, kind of a great setup to, to use this approach to, to better understand disease. And then lastly, um, the question of how much heterogeneity is there from one patient with GA to another does that correlate with differences in clinical presentation? Does that correlate with differences in uh, histologic changes? And really the same thing for sarcoidosis. And so these are um, my acknowledgments and I'll probably just wrap up there so we can do Q&A. Wonderful, thank you so much, Bill. I'm gonna take over for the Q&A for Kelly. She had to run back to clinic. Um, so we had a question from Rayveda. Are there any differences between African-American and Scandinavian patients in terms of histopathology? That's a really great question. Um, not that I'm aware of. So I, I guess I would answer that by saying that um, uh, Lofgren or Lufgren syndrome, um, which is sort of an acute presentation of sarcoidosis, is more common in Scandinavian countries and relatively less common in, in Americans, in particular Black or African-American individuals. And so... Although there's not 
to my mind, a difference in histology, there is a difference in clinical behavior and sort of long-term prognosis. And I think why that is, is very interesting and something that's not fully understood. There was a, a paper from a group in Colorado uh, this year that actually implicated um, aspergillus antigens in uh, Lufgren syndrome or Lofgren syndrome. And um, that was sort of a conceptually very interesting, but is yet to be replicated by other um, groups. But I think that could potentially be, um, you know, something that we can kind of anchor upon to, to understand antigens and sarcoidosis and, you know, why some groups may respond differently and have these different clinical behaviors. It, yeah, it's a really great question. And, and I would say that um, we really need better ways to prognosticate what the long-term um, pattern will be in any individual patient. And so now we don't really have good ways of knowing who will spontaneously remit, who's going to be, you know, sort of a chronic patient and which patients need therapy. So thanks for asking. Awesome. Um, Monty has a question. I don't know if he's able to unmute, so I will ask for him. It was a question that was also in, in my mind as well. Are the JAK inhibitor trial patients still on JAK inhibitors? And if not, does the cutaneous or internal disease tend to recur after cessation? Yeah, thanks, Monty. It's, a, it's a really a, a key question. And so the simple answer is we don't fully know yet. But to answer the more specific question, um, the vast majority of the patients that participate in these trials are still on JAK inhibitor therapy. Um, we've had several that have tried to come off therapy or taper therapy. The majority of those have had disease come back, Al although um, we've had a couple patients that have been able to come off therapy and have had sustained remission of their disease. And so why, why that is is something that's of great interest to us and something we're working on understanding. Um, you know, sarcoidosis and GA is, are, I think, a little bit unique in that we often counsel patients that there may be this spontaneous remission over time. And I think that perhaps that's different from at least how we think about in our lab, other autoimmune diseases. We think of both of these as autoimmune diseases um, where patients aren't necessarily counseled that way. And so we don't know whether we're, you know, suppressing the disease long enough that we're inducing spontaneous remission or these are patients that we're going to spontaneous remit anyways, um, the ones that are able to come off therapy. But I think understanding why that happens and how therapy potentially modifies that are, are really um, important. Thank you. And sort of a related question um, about maintenance therapy. Um, so have you looked into like what type of a dose would be required for a maintenance type therapy? I mean, you were also alluding to some of the malignancies and other black box warnings. So I was just curious if you guys are starting to look into that. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think, so we, we've done a, a lot of work with biomarkers, particularly in blood, and I haven't, I didn't show that in great detail, um, but we, we've identified certain um, markers, which we think reflect how active sarcoidosis is. And so I, I guess I would say that um, anecdotally, patients that appear to require a relatively higher dose of therapy appear to just have like more robust disease activation at baseline. Whereas those that may be able to get away on a lower dose in the long term have relatively lower, um, you know, disease activation, if you want to call it that. And so, in terms of tofacitinib in particular, um, a couple of our patients have required after the trial tofacitinib 10 milligrams twice daily, which is the higher of the FDA approved doses, to get full clearance of their skin. Whereas um, at least one patient has been able to maintain their skin clear on just five milligrams once daily, and so. What, what um, sort of sets that, you know, rheostat or thermostat of what the baseline disease activity and what the apparent dose required to control it is um, unclear to us. Um, but, you know, the, to the second part of the question, like what's the, the relevance of these safety warnings? Um, for those that aren't aware, JAK inhibitors have important safety warnings, including um, adverse cardiovascular events and thrombosis and, you know, discussing where the warnings came from and why are, is a very long conversation. Um, but, you know, sarcoidosis in particular is, is the disease that um, has significant morbidity and mortality associated with it. And really the alternative is prednisone. Um, 
which, you know, if prednisone was studied in a randomized trial now, probably would have a lot of different box warnings, but it's just been around for so long. Um, and so we really were interested in what's the risk benefit profile long-term and in, in, in this specific disease, we just don't know that yet, but I appreciate the question. Awesome. Um, Sean Quattro says, amazing talk, Bill. Thoughts on the blood versus skin specific biomarker signatures. Also thoughts on resident memory T cells in both sarcoid and GA. Yeah, um, great, <laughs> great question. Um, maybe I'll start with the second one first. So when we first started this work, um, my hypothesis was that um, GA was going to be a TRM or T resident memory cell disease and sarcoidosis was going to be a T central memory disease just based on the clinical patterns that we observed. Um, but it looks like it's not that simple. And so right now our, our, our numbers are low, um, but we haven't really been able to definitively show one way or the other um, that, that that's the case, but it, it's something we are really interested in. And we're also interested in how T cell clonotypes, which are expanded in sarcoidosis, whether an individual patient with skin involvement or lung involvement, whether it's the same T cell clonotypes that are involved um, in skin and lung, or whether there are different T cell clonotypes. And we don't have a great handle on that. But what I will say is we, in terms of at least the skin, we see the same T cell clonotype expansion from um, anatomically different lesions. Um, we don't know how that correlates to internal organ involvement yet. And so I, I think it's a really fascinating question. And sarcoidosis is really so unique. I mean, if you think about a couple other diseases, maybe like lupus that can affect so many different organs, um, you know, why that is, is not fully clear and why we see the, the great heterogeneity is also not fully clear, but it's something that we're really interested in. And I've spoken so long, I forgot the first part of the question. It was the blood versus skin biomarkers. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so we correlated uh, skin and blood biomarkers. And in general, there seemed to be a direct correlation, but not for every marker. Um, we're also in, really interested in lung sarcoidosis where um, IL-17 has been implicated. And we haven't really seen that much of it in skin. And so we're, we're interested in whether that's a technique-based difference or that's real biology. Um, and that's also something we're really interested in. Awesome. Uh, so we have two other questions that are sort of related to side effect profiles um, and, and, and malignancy. So the first question is from Nicole. Non-melanoma skin cancer is associated with sarcoidosis. Are the patterns of NMSC different in those patients or does it follow the general population pattern? That's a great question. I would probably say it in general follows a population pattern. Um, in, in our patients, with granulomatous disorders, we haven't had any non-melanoma skin cancers yet. So it's a little bit hard for me to definitively um, comment. But I, I think you raise an important point in that um, part of the reason that we think uh, JAK inhibitors are so effective in granulomatous disorders is because they can inhibit interferon gamma. And interferon gamma, as many folks may know, is important in immune surveillance for cancer. And um, that probably, um, these drugs probably are impairing that to some extent. And so I think really following the long-term safety signals for non-melanoma skin cancer for internal malignancies is really going to be important in understanding how different JAK specificities um, sort of affect that risk um, is going to be really important. It's a great question. And hopefully we have time for one last question. Um, do you utilize echocardiography before tofacitinib administration? Um, that's also a really, really good question. Um, so yeah, in, you know, in general, if a patient has a new diagnosis of sarcoidosis, there are a number of things we think about. Probably paramount is whether or not there's heart involvement. Um, of course, heart involvement is relatively rare, but it can have relatively devastating consequences. And so although you're less likely to find involvement in the heart by looking for it, it's probably the most important site of disease to identify uh, and screen for. And so I'll ask patients if they have um, palpitations or you know, skip heartbeats, if they have any episodes of lightheadedness or dizziness, um, if they have a diagnosis of sarcoidosis in their skin and they have a positive review of systems for either of those things, they'll go to cardiology. Um, if they don't, um, I think EKG is a good screening test, and I think the literature would review would um, would support that. 
Um, and so I guess to answer the question, I don't order an echo at baseline for everybody, but cardiology often will. Um, and they use things like um, cardiac MRI to, to if they're really suspicious for sarcoidosis. Um, but all, all patients will also get a review system for pulmonary involvement and you know eye involvement. And so referral to ophthalmology and pulmonology is also quite common for these patients. So I think it's important to think broadly about which organs might be involved beyond the skin. Awesome. And for my own curiosity, so you think Jack one is driving both, but the context is probably different. Do you have any indication yet about the cellular context of that Jack one signature? No. <laughs> I mean, yes and no. Nothing, nothing, nothing definitive. Um, but you know, I, I we've really, although we, I guess I would say that we didn't. In our initial work, we didn't really see much TH2 um, activation in GA. And we're starting to see that a little bit more we, as we've looked at additional cases. And we think there may be this TH2, like wound healing fibrosis kind of response um, that might also be on the board in addition to TH1 and GA. Whereas sarcoidosis, if you, um, if you were to, if you believe in M1 macrophages, if you were to look at M1 macrophage genes and the signals that turn those on and what you expect to see, I mean, it's really kind of purely an M1 disease, whereas um, GA seems to be sort of a mixed M1, M2 disease. And some of the signals may be coming from fibroblasts. Um, but yeah, not, not fully sure yet, but I appreciate the question. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's great. All the progress you guys have made uh, to help patients and actually get some viable treatment options to the clinic. So thank you very much. Um, and thanks to everybody for attending. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.